Well, good afternoon, good evening. This is our 10th lecture as we do in a course on historical theology, specifically looking at the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Trinity. In our last lecture, we started uh, looking at the uh, Cappadocian trio, the Cappadocian fathers, kind of really the architects of Trinitarian theology, uh, specifically in its Eastern Eastern tradition form. So um, really solid guys here. Um, again, they are, they are the pillars that we stand on uh, when it comes to the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of God. And last time we looked at Gregory of Nyssa. Now we're going to look at Gregory of Nazianzus. Uh, let's see. There he is. Well, again, it's, it's not a true picture, but uh, it's one that I found and I've used it before. Um, so he was born around 330, lived till 389. And yeah, again, there's a little quote there from him. It says, The Godhead exists undivided in beings divided. It is as if they were a single intermingling of light, which existed in three mutually connected suns. Now, I did, again, this is from part of the lecture, that, that quote. And so when he says undivided in beings, he doesn't mean like the being of God. It would be more the the persons within the Godhead. Um, again, sometimes that, that language was sometimes used. Obviously, we're much more precise now. Um, and again, you, you would see him that ultimately the, the Godhead cannot be truly, truly divided. Um, otherwise, we don't have God. We have three gods, right? So, <clears throat> anyways, okay. So, oops, back up there. So, one of the Cappadocian fathers, as I've stated, he was given the title as the theologian. Why is it going to that one? Okay. All right. The theologian. And he was, as I mentioned, instrumental in the development of the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, specifically, the distinct terms to describe the persons of the Godhead. And we get the terminology of unbegotten, eternally begotten, and procession. Now, Gregory's main contribution to the development of Christology was in his opposition to Apollinarius. Uh, he argued, well, Gregory argued that when Adam fell, all of humanity fell in him. We believe that, right? That's orthodox. Therefore, that fallen nature must be fully united to the Son, body, soul, and mind, for the unassumed is the unhealed. That's a very common common phrase you will hear throughout uh, uh, the Christian tradition. The unassumed is the unhealed. And so we'd say the assumed is the healed as well, right? Um, so therefore, all of humanity, body, soul, and mind, the Son took up in the flesh. And so there was a, an opposition to that, and that's through Apollinarianism. Uh, Apollinarianism came from the uh, 4th century bishop named uh, Laodicea Apollinarius. Uh, you can see it there. So he declared that in, in Christ's incarnation, he took on a human body and a soul, but not the, not a human mind or the spirit, which we call in the Greek as nous. So he argued that to have a human spirit is to have a free will. But where there is free will, there's also sin. You can see where this is going, right? Because Christ cannot sin. Therefore, he concluded that Christ operated solely on the basis of a divine mind or nous. Now, the church rejected this in the Council of Constantinople in 381. Um, and so, obviously, again, if if he didn't assume our mind, then he did not heal our mind. And that's what uh, ultimately the, the, the debate was here. And again, obviously, again, we see it as a, as a heresy. So, But uh, for tonight, we're going to be looking at um, called the, the theological orations uh, that Gregory had, had written. Um, he had, I think there's, oh, there's a ton of them, but the ones today, it's the, the five theological orations that he wrote. Or not to, I was thinking of the chapters, not the actual orations, but uh, the five orations that he wrote. They were a set of sermons delivered in Constantinople in 380, which articulate Gregory's doctrine of God and the Trinity. So we're going to start with uh, his second theological oration. Excuse me. So here he expounds his doctrine of God, where he as, whereby he ascends up to him through contemplation of the things he has created, or going from effect to cause. And you see this very often in the church fathers of this contemplation of God up to him through what he has made. And so 
Um, uh, Gregory would cite us uh, uh, Romans 1 19 through 20, uh, Psalm 8 1. So the, the, the effect is what God has created around us, and we would then now contemplate up to Him, almost like a, a stairway or a pathway to God. Um, excuse me. But He does not begin that way. Right? He reflects on the incomprehensible mystery of God to which no one can ascend. In contemplating the grandeur of God, no one can know what the divine nature is. Rather, the created things God has brought forth governs, Gregory writes, are, quote, indications of himself he has left behind, a, quote, adverted figure, end quote. And then he cites Exodus 33, 21 through 2. And this averted figure is impossible to describe. Now, obviously, when we think about the book of Romans, chapter 1, um, creation around us was to be the evidence of the divine nature and eternal power of God. Obviously, God is spirit and you can't see him. So really, it's, his whole point is that he's beyond grasping. Um, I think he's incomprehensible. But we can grasp, obviously grasp something of God that's true and real and um, satisfactory for us as creatures. So Gregory writes, quote, To grasp so great a mystery is utterly beyond real possibility, even so far as the very elevated are concerned, never mind the slack and sinking souls, end quote. What we have right is a, quote, scant emanation, a small beam from a great light. So he's making a comparison and saying that, that to obviously to to grasp the mystery, whether you are um, of the elite in your mind or you're of the sinking slack soul, right? It is impossible. It is impossible. Now, what was seen in the time of the Old Testament and New Testament uh, was expressed visions of the Lord God was his presence, not his essence, Gregory says. It said, none saw, none told of God's nature. While Gregory is convinced of God's existence, it is a whole nother matter to know what it is. All right. So, so again, he says, when you look at what we see in Scripture, that it was his presence, his presence, not his essence. Next slide. As he moves towards contemplation of God, Gregory provides a simple apologetic regarding God's existence. Quote, as the creative and sustaining cause of all, end quote. And then he writes, quote, No one, seeing a beautifully elaborated lyre with its harmonious orderly arrangement and hearing the lyre's music will fail to form a notion of its craftsman player to recur to him in thought, though ignorant of him by sight. So it's, it's, it kind of seems like, I mean, I guess we could use like a guitar. Um, when we think about how it sounds and the arrangement of it, we think of somebody that has to be playing it. But obviously to him, we are ignorant of who that would be by our sight. It's not a profound argument, it, and it isn't something that only elite intellectuals can understand. And that's not his point, as he wants everybody to understand this. But it merely affirms what God's word declares about God, as he has clearly revealed himself in creation of the world. However... As Paul indicates, what can be known about God is evident in creation. In other words, creation provides the grounds to know that God exists, but we cannot know what God is. Right? So we know that he exists, but what he is we do not know. Affirming that is the case, Gregory takes a deductive approach in forming a conception of God, which he also formulates as a manner of of argumentation against those who think that God has a body. He writes, quote, Is it corporeal? How then can it be boundless, limitless, formless, impalpable, invisible? Can bodies be such? The arrogance of it. This is not the nature of bodies. Or is it corporeal without these properties? The grossness of it to say that deity has no properties superior to ours. How could it be worth worship were it bound? So you notice a lot of the exclamation points. So I'm sure he was really driving this really hard in his discussion. So we see from Gregory a basic assumption that God is incorporeal, namely that God doesn't have composition. Right? We as creatures are composite. God is simple. 
And the logic is straightforward because scripture attributes omnipresence, omnipotence, eternity, and infinity to God. Infinity, sorry. And therefore, for God to be as such, quote, dissolution is utterly alien to the prime nature. Now, dissolution would be what? Obviously, composition would be parts. He's, in a sense, saying here that God has no body. Though he didn't explicitly use the word, his conclusion regarding God's non-composite nature is an affirmation of his simplicity. God's incorporeality, Gregory writes, does not explain his essential being. He further notes that the apophatic statements, like negative theology, right? So the, the apophatic statements from negative theology that we say is ingenerate, unoriginate, uh, immutable, and immortal, do not aid in the manner either. Now, it's important to note Gregory's affirmation and understanding of what negative theology does not intend to do, namely, teach us something positive about God. Now, Gregory argues that one must provide negative statements, but also positive assertions of what God is to gain a proper understanding. Now, this is important because when we get in the, I guess, the various circles of classical theism and you have guys online or you know, having debates, and whether it's in written form, uh, social media form, there's a tendency to just to kind of to hammer the the negative attributes or the apophatic statements. But at the end of the day, all you keep saying is what God is not. We have to have the positive assertions to gain a proper understanding of what God is. Now, I, I get it. It's kind of more of a response to those that are uh, relational theists that really emphasize more the the attributes of personhood that creatures have and, and, and wanting to make that clear delineation between the creature and the creator. So again, I understand the debate, understand the arguments, but we have to use both. So uh, in his discussion up to this point, Gregory reveals his true intentions in taking up this exercise. He says, quote, I wanted to make plain the incomprehensibility of deity to the human mind and it's totally unimaginable grandeur, end quote. Now, there are two outcomes in contemplating on the grandeur of God. Either we fall into the dangerous trap of idolatry, which is making the visible a deity, when using earthly objects or concepts to describe what the divine essence is, or we, quote, discover God through the beauty and order of things seen, using sight as a guide to what transcends sight without losing God through the grandeur of what it sees, end quote. So that the latter path of discovery is prescriptive of how we are to reflect on the divine essence of God. So sight is intended to guide us to the transcendent, but what we see is not transcendent. The material reality is a metaphor for the spiritual reality. We run into gross error when we mistake the material, material for the spiritual. God's nature is hidden behind God's ways. Gregory writes, There is nowhere for man to go when it comes to the fathomless depths of God's ways, of which Solomon in all of his wisdom only drew further into an abyss the more he searched and pondered the profundities of God. The Apostle Paul came to a standstill when approaching the impenetrably towering wall of God's judgments and ways. He had nowhere to climb. All he could do is revel in, quote, the, I'm sorry, all he could do is re revel in impassioned wonder and acknowledgement of the incomprehensibility of God's judgments. Now, <clears throat> in sections 24 through 31 in his oration, Gregory marvels over the astounding and perplexing creation all around him, whereby he perceives the divine power and eternal nature of God. Again, going back to Romans 1, 19 through 20. As clearly revealed in the things he has made. Gregory's, uh, he gives a poetic account of creation, asking elegantly phrased questions about things minute to the grandest of elements within creation. It is quite remarkable. Speaking of fish and birds, spiders, bees, fruit, trees, the seas and oceans, the sky and the heavens, and the intense brilliance of the sun, where a clear display of excitement and awe are observed. In looking at all of creation, Gregory concludes that, quote, reason has no explanation of what upholds the world except the will of God, end quote. And he cites 
Revelation 4.11, that all things were created by God's will, and by God's will they were created and sustained, I think, or something like that, yeah. Anyways, so in the face of natural philosophers, Gregory jabs at their, quote, futile cleverness, end quote, in their account of the vastness and powerful motion of the oceans through con though contained as bodies of water, providing a short and truthful answer. God commands a fence for the waters, and his command binds them. <clears throat> and as he brings this oration to a close, he writes, What do you say? Shall we stop our preaching here at matter and objects of sight? Or, since Scripture recognizes the tabernacle of Moses as a symbol for the whole world, the world I mean of things visible and, in and invisible, shall we pass through the first veil, transcending sense, to bend our gaze on holy things, on ideal and heaven transcending reality? But not even this can we see as something free of body, even if it actually be so, since it has fire and wind for its name or created being." End quote. Gregory speaks of all the angelic creatures, powers, dominions, thrones, etc. Yet each one of them is under God according to its ranking. Quote, making all things obey the beck and call of him who alone fashioned them. They him God's majesty in everlasting contemplation of everlasting glory. Not to make glot... No. <laughs> like I said, every video I do that. Not to make God glorious... God, whose fullness supplies all else with excellence, cannot be added to, but to leave beings supreme after God with no surface undone. End quote. So now we're going to get into Gregory's Doctrine of the Trinity. Here we go. Gregory's Doctrine of the Trinity. Now, because of the foundational importance of Gregory's doctrine of the Trinity in Orthodox classical theism, a review of his Trinitarian doctrine is worthy of independent study. Definitely is, and just as we will be doing that with Augustine. So, uh, Gregory's clear statement on the Trinity is found in his Oration 25, uh, sections 15 through 18, and some of his other writings as well we will bring into our study. But a little background is in order. So in Oration 25 uh, is a series of sermons delivered in 380. As a gesture of gratitude, Gregory dedicates Oration 25 to the Christian philosopher named Maximus the Cynic as a sort of charge for him to push forward and remain strong in the orthodox teachings of the faith. And these sections are that articulation of orthodoxy. So first we're going to look at um, a, a, creedal, a kind of a creedal statement that Gregory outlines the orthodox doctrine of the trinity stating our definition sorry so god unbegotten the father and one begotten lord his son referred to as god when he is mentioned separately but lord when he is named in conjunction with the father the one term on account of his nature the other on account of his monarchy and we'll be talking about the monarchical view here uh, shortly that that really was very um, um distinctive of of the cappadocians and one Holy Spirit proceeding, or if you will, going forth from the Father, God to those with the capacity to apprehend things that are interrelated, but in fact resisted by the impious, though so recognized by their betters and actually so predicated by the more spiritual. I know it's kind of a clunky statement. Neither should we place the Father beneath first principle, so as to avoid positing a first or the first, thus necessarily destroying primary existence, nor say that the Son or the Holy Spirit is without beginning. Thus we shall avoid depriving the Father of his special characteristic. Par uh, paradoxically, they are not without beginning, and in a sense they are. They are not in terms of causation, since they are indeed from God, although they are not subsequent to him, just as light is not subsequent to the Son, but they are without beginning in terms of time since they are not subject to it. So if you're tracking with me again, he's saying that they, they don't have a beginning, but in a sense they do, and the comparison he makes is between a sun and its rays. We know that to have the sun, you have to have the rays. The rays are instantaneously 
from the sun. The, 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 the light comes from that sun. You can't have those. But in a sense, we would say the light, the rays, come from the sun. And so that's the kind of analogy that he's making. And you see this quite often in the early church fathers using that analogy. I think it's very helpful. <clears throat> so he says, Otherwise, that which is transitory would be antecedent to things that abide, and that which has no independent existence to things that do. For what the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have in common is their divinity and the fact that they were not created, while for the Son and the Holy Spirit it is the fact that they are from the Father. In turn, the special characteristic of the Father is his ingenerateness, of the Son his generation, and of the Holy Spirit its procession. End quote. So a key aspect in Cappadocian Trinitarianism is the monarchical order of the Godhead, whereby the Father is the source. You'd also see the phrase or the word, uh, he's the principle, he's unbegotten, or he's ingenerated. And then the Son is begotten, or you would say he's generated. And then the Spirit who proceeds from the Father. Now, if you recall from the last lecture, we spoke about the filioque clause, which ultimately is the change uh, in the Western in the Western view of the Trinity, which would say then that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Uh, but here again, the the Eastern tradition says the Spirit proceeds from the Father um, only. Now I don't have only here, but that's what it entails. Because what they mean is that, well, hold on, I'll, I'll get to it and we'll explain it further. <laughs> so the Father as source is his special characteristic from which the Son and the Spirit find their causal origin. It is important that when reading Gregory's account, we understand that this use of cause is not temporal. Rather, it is an implication of the oneness of God according to Scripture's presentation of God. And so the passage is cited is Romans 1.7, 1 Corinthians 1.9 uh, and 8.6, 2 Corinthians 1.2, 3.13, I'm sorry, 13.13, 13, Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, James 1.1, 1, 1, and 1 Peter 1.3. So again, they don't mean causal as then coming into, or, or, or a cause in a temporal order, right? The cause has to do of the oneness as being the cause. So in the Son and the Spirit being generated from the Father as the cause, or as cause, which is an eternal act, with the active terms denoting relations, as they both have the same divine nature, their point of origin from the Father delineates the relation, thus a real distinction to him. So again, the Father is cause. The, the um, active terms of the Son, right, who's generated from the Father, and then the active term of the Spirit proceeding from the Father is to show the relations... As the Father is the point of origin, thus therefore they have a real distinction from the Father and from each other. Again, but this isn't three separate beings, right? It's the one being of God with the persons in the active terms showing the relations uh, that share in the divine nature. The Father is always Father. Therefore, he has always had a Son. The Son is not the Father. The Son is not the Spirit. The Father is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father. So giving priority to the Father and the Godhead is what maintains Christian monotheism. And again, this is for the Eastern tradition. Obviously in 10... Is it 54? Is it Council of Trent? Gosh, I better know this stuff. Don't quote me on that right now. Let me look it up. Hold on. Church history. Oh, this should be a plug. So these are great to have. Pocket Dictionary of Church History, Pocket Dictionary of Theological Terms, and Pocket Dictionary all right, of Apologetics and Philosophy of History, or Philosophy of Religion, I'm sorry. So, real quick here, I don't want to say something wrong. We're going to go to, uh, let's see, the F A, B, C, D, E, F, I know my alphabet. Let me see, where is it at? Oh, come on, Brian. Don't. Philly Oakway... Okay, I had the year right, 1054, 1054, right? So this was the schism between the Roman and Catholic, sorry, between the Roman Catholic and Eastern churches, Eastern Orthodox churches, there was a schism. So ultimately it's the creed that, they, that came afterwards, right? Is it the uh, 6th century church council in Toledo? 
they added the word filioque to a creed describing the procession of the Holy Spirit. The creed affirmed that the Holy Spirit was sent by the Father and the Son, and then they ground this in John 14, 26. The Eastern Church objected to this addition, arguing that it exceeded what the Bible said about the procession of the Spirit, all the while affirming that Christ was co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. Um, so ultimately, by this discussion here, when this took place, this ultimately created two branches of Christendom, and be, again, that was the schism between the Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox churches. Again, great source. Can't remember everything, right? Okay. Or was that? Um, hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah. So giving prior to the Father and the Godhead is what maintains Christian monotheism. So, and therefore, the Father has the primary causality in God, whereby the divine will is carried out in one divine act, not three wills carrying out three divine acts. So do you see again how that retains the monotheism is that God, if we are truly monotheists, there can only be one God. And so the Father is the cause. He has priority in the Godhead. And there's that one will of God. But then we would say the Son has his will through the Father. And the Spirit has his will through the Father. So it's it's a not a not a shared will, but the one will of God carried out in three persons, all being tethered back, in a sense, to the monarchical view, to the, the cause, to the, the first principle, which would be the Father. So again, the logic behind the monarchical ordering is that if the Son and the Spirit are given the same characteristic of the Father, which is what? Which is um, ungenerateness, right? Um, is unbegotten is the first principle or even just the characteristic of being father if if they are given that same characteristic then we have three sources three distinct beings thus three gods so you track with me on how that that logic plays out if we're saying though they have the same substance the same essence of the father that characteristic and then that's that specific of the father Ultimately, we create three beings instead of the Son and the Spirit being from the Father, which retains the, the monotheism of the Christian tradition. So he says here, the Godhead, the Godhead exists undivided in beings. And I put in there as persons divided. It doesn't mean like three beings. And again, I mentioned um, this might have been an area where his, his terminology was not very precise as it should be. He says, it, it is as if they were a single intermingling of light, which existed in three mutually connected suns. When we look at the Godhead, the primal cause, the soul sovereignty, we have a mental picture of the single whole, certainly. But when we look at the three in whom the Godhead exists, and at those who derive, and at those, sorry, and as those who derive their timeless and equally glorious being from the primal cause, we have three objects of worship. Now Gregory here affirms the eternality of the Son and the Spirit. He says, since there never was a time when he began to be a son, otherwise there would be a time when the son, when the one was not a father and the other not a son. End quote. Elsewhere he writes, the son must share in the glory of the uncaused because he stems from the uncaused. End quote. And then of the Spirit, he says, truly holy in that there is no other like it in quality or manner, and in that its holiness is not conferred, but is holiness in the absolute, and in that it is not more or less, nor did it begin or will it end in time. End quote. So obviously we see that Gregory affirms the full divinity, the full essence, the full eternality of the Spirit and of the Son, but there's a distinction because they are from the Father, the Father, who is the primary cause. Again, we can't think of cause sequentially or temporarily, right? It's the origin. It's the origin of the being of God starts with the Father, and thus we have that monarchical, monarchical perspective of the Trinity. So the distinctions between the three are a matter of relational order, not nature. And with the Father as the only source of the Trinity, his unique identity, Nicene Orthodoxy, stands opposed to Arianism, and Sibelianism. 
It avoids the fatal errors of these aberrant theologies in that the Son is not a creature, as according to Arianism, nor is God merely three different manifestations of one person, according to Sibelianism. With the monarchy of the Father, he is the source of the Trinity and the source of the three divine persons or divine hypostasis. Sis, 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 hypostasis. <laughs> For Gregory, the oneness of God is maintained if both Son and Spirit are causally, causally related to the Father alone without being merged or fused into him, and if they all share one and the same movement and purpose, end quote, being identical in essence. So we avoid tritheism because the Father as the source, who is, importantly, without source, of divinity shares it with the Son and the Spirit by means of his eternal generation and procession. And the Son, in the temporal sense, is the source of all things, Thus also he is the Lord of all things, including time. So the Father, in the eternal sense, is the cause of the Son, for he is the Father's word, who speaks and brings creation into existence. You see that in Psalm 148, verse 5. That's in the Septuagint. This act of creation is ineffable. God's act of will and its fulfillment are identical. End quote. So scripture declares the divine qualities of the Son and the Spirit, which is in reference to their, their source being that of God the Father. So when Jesus refers to the Father being greater than he is in John 14, 28, Gregory interprets this statement to mean, quote, the Father's superiority to the Son as the eternal source of his existence, end quote. This is contrary to Augustine, who prefers to see it as the Son's economic inferiority as the incarnate Lord. I have a footnote here. Gregory does take up the matter. He states, quote, The explanation of, explanation of the Father is greater than the Son, considered as a man is true, but trivial. Is there anything remarkable, remarkable about God's being greater than man? Certainly this must be our answer to those who preen themselves on their being greater uh, postulation, end quote. To him, it's a no-brainer. Like, why do you have to even make that claim? How, who's going to reject saying that that God, right, is considered uh, greater than than man? Um, I think definitely what he says is pretty helpful. Um, but again, it's it's both ways. It's they they have their strengths. <clears throat> okay, so in Oration twenty nine, section fourteen, Gregory does away with any notions of an inferiority in the Son by those who emphasize the divine names, overlooking the unique, equally shared divine nature. In doing so, Gregory writes, you, quote, rob the son of its unique of his unique deity and make him subordinate. You give the son a second level in quality and worship, end quote. Now, this, this quote here, this quote here is from me. Now, you may or may not find it profound. Um, that's not the intention. I actually made a little joke about this, saying this is what, this, this note was found in a fortune cookie in the Nicene era, but this kind of really uh, encapsulates the, the the contentions and the debates and the divisions and the challenges that was going on this time. This was the the main thing. So here it is: when we plunge into deep, sorry, we plunge into deep error when we mistakenly assume names indicate quality of nature or differing substance. The names designate relationships between the persons of the Godhead all share <clears throat> in the same substance. We look at the controversies and the heresies going around, around, around. This was the big problem. Uh, as we looked at, uh, I think it was our last one, uh, Gregory of Nyssa, he was challenging Eunomius, who, who made this mistake of thinking the name indicated the nature and not the relationship. Excuse me. And many others uh, in, in this time made the same, same mistake. Okay. So in, in Oration 23.11, Gregory offers a succinct definition of the Trinity. He writes, um, hold on a second here. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. The Trinity, my brothers. Again, he is um, having uh, uh, an oration. He's given a, not a sermon. Yeah, I guess a sermon. He says, the Trinity, my brothers, is truly a Trinity. Trinity does not mean an itemized collection of disparate elements. If it did... 
what would prevent us from calling it a decad or a centad, which is a hundred, or a myriad if the number of components so justified it? The arithmetical possibilities or arithmetical, arithmetical, I like arithmetical, arithmetical, you can use that too. <laughs> But I will say that arithmetical possibilities are many, indeed, more than these examples. Rather, Trinity is a comprehensive relationship between equals who are held in equal honor. The term unites in one word members that are one by nature and does not allow things that are indivisible to suffer fragmentation when their number is divided. It's a good quote. In Oration 2517, Gregory addresses some of the concerns, thus errors, that stem from a human understanding of a monarchical view of God. First, addressing worship, he notes the miraculous manner of its union as Trinity. Therefore, we are worshiping the one true God. As it pertains to the Son, again, the human mode needs to be dispelled, dispelled as being generated. He does not have passions as human generation entails. For the divine is impassable even in generation. Generation does not mean creation. Therefore, generation is not temporal. Otherwise, the Son wouldn't be divine, thus not part of the Godhead. It's a very clear, concise statement. Now, as of the procession, speaking of the Spirit, he says, Gregory writes, We only know of proceeding by biological means, of the Spirit proceeding from the Father. Quote, Let us go mad, for prying into God's secrets, end quote. Again, we are speaking of the incomprehensible. We are trying to come up with a grammar to allow us to say things about God that are true, yet are not fully comprehensible, but ultimately point us to things that are comprehensible for our little three-pound brains. So Gregory gives us a helpful reminder about the intention of the language be language being used in Trinitarian discourse. The names do not present any manner of shortcoming or deficiency in the Godhead. Rather, they are for the purposes of, quote, safeguarding the distinctness of the three hypostases within the single nature and quality of the Godhead, end quote. For Gregory, the monarchy of the Father is the foundational principle in Trinitarian logic and the fundamental dynamic that contains and gives meaning to the grammatical aspects of consubstantial unity and relational distinctness. Oh, that was a quote, sorry. That was from, not Gregory, but from Christopher Bealey. He has a great article called Divine Causality and the Monarchy of God the Father and Gregory of Nazianzus. That's from Harvard Theological Review, 100, number 2, April 2007. So he summed it up quite nicely. So, back to Gregory. We call the Spirit, Spirit, because he is not the Son or the Father. He has his own role in the divine economy, as revealed to us in the New Testament. All three have the full divine nature, each one complete in oneself by identity of being and power. Gregory writes that, that this is how we can best explain and understand the Trinity. If it, quote, is convincing, we ought to thank God for the insight. If not, we should look for a better one, end quote. In conclusion, it is important that we say something about the Father as cause. Uh, Gregory's emphasis on the Father as the source of the Godhead, the Trinity, does not mean the Father is the originator of divinity, as in the cause of the divine nature. That's important, right? Rather, the Father as source alone is, ah, uh, say, self-existent. He has life in himself and has shared it with the Son. And the Spirit eternally proceeds from the source, being of the same divine nature from the Father, but distinctly not the Son. Remember, the names speak of relations, not of substance or nature or essence. And all three manifest themselves in one divine act of redemption. Quote, a truly golden chain of salvation. From the Spirit comes our rebirth. From rebirth comes a new creating. From new creating, a recognition of the worth of him who affected it. End quote. So what we see in Gregory of Nazianzus is a consistent, logical understanding of a doctrine of God that retains monotheism, but accounts for Trinitarianism. Again, 
he provided the really strong, clear grammar that we needed to talk of things about God that the, that the scriptures present to us, but we also need a, a grammar to talk about it. His monarchical understanding is the prevailing view in the Eastern tradition, whereas Augustine's model is the more prevalent one in the Western tradition. Many debates have occurred over the years, arguing that Cappadocians and Augustine differ on how one should approach the Trinity. One says to start with the three and work to the one, whereas one says to start with the one and work to the three. Um, and we'll be covering more of that as we get to Augustine. Um, but that's it for Gregory of Nazianzus. We'll be looking at our, at our last of the Cappadocian trio next time. Uh, that will be St. Basil. And until then, hope this was helpful. Uh, take care and see you next time.